Jacob, thanks so much for making time. Really excited to do this with you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Jason. Of course. So you've ran for president. You're an attorney. Maybe you can give a little bit of background about yourself so that people get a better sense of who you are, and then we can jump into some specific topics that I had questions for. All right. Well, I grew up in uh, Laredo, Texas on a farm on the Rio Grande. Uh, I was raised there and uh, went to high school there and then went off to college at Virginia Military Institute, got a degree in economics, got a law degree at the University of Texas, returned home to practice law in partnership with my dad. Um, and then I ultimately left the law practice to go into the libertarian movement. I was offered a job with a libertarian foundation in New York. And I was program director there. It's called the Foundation for Economic Education. And then after a couple of years there, I decided to start my own nonprofit educational foundation. And that's called the Future of Freedom Foundation. And our mission is to present a principled case for the libertarian philosophy. And so that's what I've been doing for the past, oh, 33 years or so. And that was after about uh, 12 years of practicing law. What is the libertarian philosophy? What is the movement? Maybe you could explain that. Uh, well, it, the, the central core principle of libertarianism is that people ought to be free to live their lives any way they choose, uh, so long as their conduct is peaceful, as long as they're not going out and murdering and raping and stealing and defrauding people, that people ought to be free to live their lives the way they want. And this is totally contrary to the Republican and Democrat or liberal and conservative philosophies that that feel that, no, the government should be controlling what, how people live their lives and punish them if they live their lives in ways that the government doesn't approve of. Uh, good examples like the drug war. Uh, Democrats and Republicans say we need to put people in jail for ingesting substances that the government doesn't approve of. Libertarians say, oh, no, on the contrary. We, people should be free to ingest whatever they want, no matter how dangerous or harmful it might be. In the area of economic uh, liberty, libertarians believe that people should be free to keep their own money and decide for themselves what to do with it. Uh, so we don't believe in Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all these socialist programs that force people to, to care for others. We believe that charity belongs in the private sector, and so we say, let people keep everything they earn and decide for themselves what to do with it. We believe in open immigration, um, open borders, where people are free to cross borders in search of a better life without being punished by the state for it, which, of course, is contrary to the Democratic-Republican philosophy. And we also oppose all these foreign wars and foreign interventions and foreign aid and we would say we want to restore a limited government republic and dismantle the national security state type of government that we have. So those are some examples of how much we differ as libertarians from the Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and liberals. It's fascinating. You ran for president twice. My understanding is that it's legislated that there's a two-party system. It's actually in the bylaws of our country that we are relegated to only having two parties. How did you run as a third-party candidate? Under our system of government, any political party can form. Uh, there's nothing that prohibits uh, new political parties. It's just that they put tremendous barriers, the Democrats and Republicans do, to the formation of political parties and then candidates running against them. I mean, they, they don't like the competition. What we libertarians believe is that there's really no fundamental difference between a Democrat and Republican. And um, it's just one big welfare warfare state party divided into two wings. Um, so the Libertarian Party formed in 1971. It, it's the third largest political party in the country. Uh, we have um, candidates at all levels of government. Our presidential candidate normally is on the ballot in all 50 states. Uh, so I ran for the nomination in 2020 in, two, in 2000. I lost. Uh, then in uh, this last time around, I ran again, lost again. Uh, so that's that's how it works, uh, that you, you, you run for the nomination for the Libertarian Party. If you get it, you're the nominee and you're running against the presidential and vice presidential candidates for the major parties. I came across your profile because you had written an article about how JFK was most likely assassinated by our own government. How did you come to that conclusion? Well, for me, it's not even the most likely thing. There's, to me, there's no question that they did this. And uh, I'd, I'd been reading a lot of literature ever since the 1990s when the Assassination Records Review Board came into existence as a result of Oliver Stone's movie JFK. And that was the commission that... 
uh, that mandated, that was enforcing the JFK Records Act, which mandated that federal agencies had to disclose their records. So over the years, I did a lot of studying, um, but nothing really convinced me beyond a reasonable doubt, let us say, of that this was a national security state regime change operation until I came across a five-volume book by a man named Doug Horn, who had served on the ARRB in the 90s. And that book revolves largely around the autopsy that was conducted on President Kennedy's body on the very night of the assassination. And Horn documents beyond any reasonable doubt whatsoever that the the autopsy was fraudulent. Um, and, and it's undisputed that it was only the military that conducted the autopsy, which is very strange because they had they had prohibited the Dallas County Medical Examiner from conducting an autopsy, which was required by state law. This was a straight murder case. And a team of Secret Service agents had forced their way out of Parkland Hospital over the vehement objections of the Dallas County Medical Examiner, which in itself is very suspicious. They, they take the body to, to Maryland and they turn it over to the military, which is so bizarre because we're not a military society. We're not supposed to be. Well, it turns out that the reason for that was that they were conducting a fraudulent autopsy. And once I realized that there was a fraudulent autopsy, and I go into detail as to the nature of the fraud in my book, The Kennedy Autopsy, but once I reached that conclusion, it was case closed because there is no innocent explanation for a fraudulent autopsy. No one has ever come up with one and, and no one ever will. Once, once it was established that the military conducted a fraudulent autopsy, that became for me the case closed beyond a reasonable doubt uh, fact that established criminal culpability on the part of the national security state. What other instances in American history do you find to be fraudulent? as to the narrative that hits the dominant discourse of our society? Well, the big one came, uh, or one of the big ones came right after the uh, assassination of President Kennedy, and that was the Gulf of Tonkin uh, resolution that that actually authorized President Johnson to initiate a full-scale war against North Vietnam. That Kennedy was, one of the things Kennedy was doing that made the national security establishment so uh, angry at him was that he was terminating the Cold War and establishing friendly relations with Russia. Well, as bad as that is now, it was a hundred times worse back then. And one of the things that Kennedy was doing in this dramatic shift in direction for America that he was instituting was to pull all the advisory troops that he had put into Vietnam. He wouldn't send combat troops, but he had sent advisory troops. Well, as soon as he was killed, the Pentagon and, and Johnson get together with a fraudulent uh, supposed attack by North Vietnamese forces on American warships in the Gulf of Tonkin in North Vietnamese waters or off North Vietnamese waters, and it was it was a totally fraudulent deal. They 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 had there had been no attack, or it was if it was an attack, it was a very minor type thing. But they blew it up into this type of thing where the North Vietnamese has attacked America, and that then g- gave rise to the the Gulf of Tonkin resolution that led us into the, the full-scale Vietnam War, where they, they sacrificed 58,000 American men of my generation, killed more than a million Vietnamese. Uh, so that comes to mind as one of the great fraudulent aspects of the of the uh, national security state. And there was also, if you know, one another example is Operation Northwoods during the Kennedy administration that the, the Pentagon presented a, a unanimous Joint Chiefs of Staff proposal to Kennedy uh, called Operation Northwoods, uh, which was kept secret for some 30 years. The ARRB uncovered it, uh, that where they were proposing actual terrorist attacks on American soil, uh, principally in Miami, that were going to be carried out by agents of the Pentagon, secret agents, but who were going to be posing as communist agents, Cuban communist agents, so that this would give Kennedy an excuse to say, well, we've been attacked by the Cuban communists, we need to invade and uh, take over the country. And to Kennedy's everlasting credit, he rejected the plan, but it was totally based on fraud. What about modern events? Do you have anything from more modern times that smacks of this sort of pattern? Uh, yeah, we've got the uh, the invasion of Iraq, uh, where uh, President Bush uh, and the Pentagon, the CIA, started claiming that, the, that there were all these WMDs in Iraq. It was an absolute fraud. It was a lie. Um, 
And, and so they, they used that as a justification for invading a country that had never attacked the United States. But Bush was upset because his father had, had not ousted Saddam Hussein during the, the Gulf War. And there had been this huge preoccupation um, for many years after that, that Saddam was going to come and get us, that Bush made a mistake. He should never have left him into power. So they come up with this huge WMD lie, a fraud, uh, to rouse up the American people. And I remember that there were a lot of Americans saying, oh, well, they have access to information that we don't have and we have to trust them. And so there was this outpouring of support for this invasion of a country, again, that had never attacked the United States. And then as proof that it was a lie, that as soon as it was established that there were no WMDs there, Bush didn't apologize. He didn't say, look, I'm sorry I made a bad mistake here. I've killed a lot of your people. I've tortured a lot of your people. We're ordering all troops back. I'm going to see about reparations for the damage we've caused. No, he kept the troops there. He ordered them keep killing them, keep killing Iraqis until we establish our government there. And they stayed for many years after that. So that, so that there is another example of a fraudulent action that, that turned out to be very deadly and destructive, both for the Iraqi people as well as for the American people. Really terrible. Were these the kinds of things that motivated you to run for president so that this way you can make sure the country's on a better course? Absolutely. I mean, the, the country's on a horrible course, and it has been for many, many years uh, because of the the warfare state direction, I mean, the, the federal government got converted to a national security state form of governmental structure after World War II. Well, what is that? Well, that's, that's a totalitarian form of governmental structure. We're talking about the CIA, the vast military industrial complex, as President Eisenhower referred to it, and who he said was a grave threat to our democratic processes, the NSA. Uh, this is totally contrary to the type of government that was called for under the Constitution, which was a limited government republic that had just a basic military force, relatively small. And then they adopted this policy of foreign interventionism that has been so destructive to America. It's getting us very close to nuclear war again, like they did during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now in Ukraine, they keep provoking uh, this nuclear armed power called Russia. They're doing the same thing with China. Uh, they, they just keep pushing the envelope with respect to nuclear war. And then you've got the massive welfare state where people have become dependent on government, the government dole, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. With Medicare, they destroyed what was the finest health care system in history. Uh, with their paper money system that they established, they, dis they destroyed the finest monetary system in history. They've put America into debt for tune of $31 trillion in climbing. Uh, so, yeah, this, this was the type of thing that motivated me to seek the nomination. I wanted to be the nominee for the Libertarian Party to take on these Democrats and Republicans for what they've done to our nation, what they've done to our liberty and our rights, and what they've done to the people of the world, and hopefully move America in a better, freer, more prosperous, peaceful, and harmonious direction. What do you mean that Medicare and Medicaid has destroyed the best healthcare system in the country? America had the finest healthcare system ever when, when I was growing up in the 50s and, and early 60s. Um, nobody had major medical insurance because nobody needed it. I mean, somebody might buy catastrophic health care, like if you got cancer or something, but nobody had regular med medical insurance like they do today. And there was a simple reason for that. Healthcare costs were low. They were stable. Going to the doctor was like going to the grocery store. People just pay cash for their for their medical services, and uh, there wasn't this sense of bankruptcy if I get sick. Um, Medicare and doctors love what they did in life. A lot of doctors made house calls, if you can imagine that. And uh, innovations in healthcare were soaring. Then in nineteen, I think it was sixty five, um, the Johnson administration adopts Medicare and Medicaid. And, and that's what ended up destroying this finest healthcare system in history. Uh, healthcare costs started soaring. That's the root cause of the soaring healthcare costs. Medicare and Medicaid, you had this gigantic governmental socialist system, and it is a socialist system that was putting demands on this, on what had been a free market system. And demand, as you know, causes prices to start rising. That's what gave rise to the perpetual healthcare crisis. Uh, it, it's still ongoing. It's never going to end. This is an inherently defective system. That's why we got Obamacare. 
the other side of this is the the the, the managed uh, part of this thing, the Centers for Disease Control. We've seen the lockdowns, the shutdowns, all the measures that they take in communist China, the, the governments here adopted. What we libertarians say is get rid of government and health care. It has no more business in health care than it does in religion. They're not competent to handle health care. Leave health care to the free market. That's our heritage. Our heritage is free markets. And that's what we had. And that's what I mean by saying they destroyed with their socialist interventionist system in health care. They destroyed what had been the finest health care system in history. Is it really possible to just stop Medicare, Medicaid? Let's say you're president tomorrow. Would you actually be able to just stop it? Well, you've got to get a repeal through Congress, but you're asking two different questions. It, would it be advisable and is it politically feasible? Well, obviously it wouldn't be political fe politically feasible if you were president. You're not a dictator. All you could do is ask Congress to repeal it and, or try to get the American people to put pressure on Congress to repeal it. But whether it should be done is another question. It absolutely should be done. Should be just if, if there was a button right here where I could push it to get rid of all these socialist programs, I would push it. It'd be the best thing that could ever happen to America. Uh, look at the direction we're headed in, Jason. I mean, you know, they're head, we're heading into national bankruptcy here. People think that, oh, well, no, it's the government that owes that debt. No, it's American taxpayers who are on the hook for that $31 trillion. That amounts to $275,000 per taxpayer. How many taxpayers can afford to pay $275,000 right now? I would say not very many, but they're on the hook for it. They may not put it on their balance sheet when they go borrow money at the bank, but it's it's there. And so, yeah, we got to get rid of all these things. And I say, you know, push the button and get rid of them. Make the how, case for it. How can we clear up the $31 trillion debt? <laughs> That's a heck of a good question, because they're spending more than what they're taking in. Uh, it's like a family. You know, if, if, you're, if you've got credit card debt of, let's say, $100,000, and, and you've got a, a salary of, of let's say, $100,000, it's not a good idea to be spending $150,000 every year, because that extra fifty you you're adding on to your credit card debt. Uh, what you're best off doing is cutting your expenses down, below your income. Let's say so now you're spending $75,000 out of your 100,000. Well, you use that 25,000 to start paying down that debt because remember you're paying interest on this thing too. And that's what they need to be doing. They need to be getting their expenses lower than the tax revenues and they use the difference to start paying off that debt. They're not doing that. They're adding on more than a trillion dollars every year. I mean, this is what this debt ceiling debate's all about. They're saying, we need to raise the debt ceiling again so we can keep adding on to this debt. This is a game that cannot go on forever. Uh, at some point, there's going to be a day of reckoning. And we learned this from, like, Greece. Uh, Greece did this. And uh, ultimately, they got to a point where their tax revenues were not sufficient to even cover the interest payments on their debt, much less all the welfare state expenditures they had. That's the day of reckoning we're headed toward. Now, we don't know. We can't predict when that's going to happen. All we can say is it's going to happen at some point. What is the solution? Why aren't politicians aware of this very obvious truth? Well, they are aware of it, but it's too difficult because the constituents that are demanding the largesse do not want to let go of the largesse. And, and politicians like to keep constituents happy because that's where they get their votes. So it's always easy to say, well, instead of raising taxes to cover all these this largesse, let's just go ahead and keep borrowing the money. And, uh, of course, the idea is let's transfer it to younger people. There, there's a lot of people in their 70s and 80s that are saying, well, I'll die before we have to pay off this debt. So what if it goes on to my children and grandchildren? Well, that's a really bad attitude. Uh, but take the military. The military expenditures are now up to over $800 billion dollars. Uh, they don't want to let go of their large yes. They, they, they are a permanent fixture, at least as far as they're concerned, in American life, and they're not going to let go of theirs. Social Security recipients, Medicare recipients, food stamp, all the welfare state people, they're not going to let go of their large yes. So you've got this real problem here. 
where the people that are receiving all of these trillions of dollars in government largesse do not want to let go of it. The politicians do not want to anger them. They want to keep giving out their candy there. Uh, where, how, does this, how does this get reconciled? Well, they're getting they're they're reconciled by just saying, let's just keep borrowing. Let's just keep borrowing. And then there's the Federal Reserve aspect of all this too. The job of the Federal Reserve is to pay off that debt in printed money. Uh, I mean, that's why the Federal Reserve was established. That's why the purchasing power of the dollar has has plummeted ever since the Federal Reserve was established. Well, they're raising interest rates right now because they've seen what they've done with prices. And when they raise the interest rates, that increases the the problem for the government paying interest on its national debt. Uh, so what does the Fed do now? If they lower interest rates to make the debt cheaper, the interest payments cheaper for the government, now we're going to have, see uh, prices start flying through the roof again. So you're re- they're really stuck at this point, and and I don't know how they're going to get out of it. It's uh, it's kind of like we're living in some very interesting times here. I'm sure there'll be some kind of creative solution that will be more financial wizardry of legal fictions or whatever it takes to make sure that this doesn't turn into a grease situation. Absolutely. I mean, they're doing that right now because the the debt ceiling has been reached. You see, a debt ceiling is an acknowledgement that too much debt is is a bad thing. And and that's a, a congressional acknowledgement, which is quite phenomenal for them to acknowledge that too much debt is a very dangerous thing. But the fact is, every time they reach the ceiling, they say, well, let's raise it again so we can add more to it. And then as soon as they raise the ceiling, they, nobody says, hey, we need to prepare for the next ceiling. We need to start slashing expenditures. They just go on as business as usual. And this is the mainstream press's attitude, too. They, they go into all this stuff about, oh, there will be a default on the debt and so forth. You've got to raise the debt ceiling. But as soon as the debt ceiling is raised... It's all back to government as, as usual. but So you're right. They will in, try to engage in wizardry, but that can only go on for so long. There, there is no way that a nation can continue borrowing itself rich. At some point, the day of reckoning comes. Now, we're a very productive nation. There's a lot of wealth in this nation. Uh, unlike Greece, uh, their, their base of support isn't as large as it is here. But it doesn't matter. The principles are universal. You borrow, you go into debt to such a large extent, at some point the day of reckoning comes. Now, at at that point, the government's going to be voracious, and everybody needs to understand that. When the government needs money, it's going to do whatever is necessary to get that money. That's why Biden just is hiring those 80-something thousand IRS agents. They need money bad. They're they're squeezing everybody they can. They're out seizing uh, yachts from Russians, multi-million dollar yachts. They're getting money everywhere they can. And make no mistake about it, a a good, ripe cherry for them to, to snatch um, our, our retirement accounts, uh, IRA accounts, 401ks, and so forth. I mean, this is what the Argentine government did when it was needing money. And uh, don't forget that the government seized everybody's gold back in the 1930s. So there's, there's actual precedent for sealing, seizing people's assets and replacing them with irredeemable bonds or, you know, that, that don't promise to pay anything like gold or silver, just, uh, just paper money, more paper. Uh, so, yeah, you're right. They will engage in wizardry, but at some point it's going to come to a head. I meant that they're going to have some kind of better solution, like some kind of program to lessen the debt over time with slashing certain expenditures, some kind of program to increase revenue. And they're, like you said, too many interests here at stake for someone to allow the dollar to just absolutely default. Well, it doesn't really need to be a default. I mean, they, they you know, it, it, what the Republicans ought to do is really stick with the, the debt ceiling and say, we're not going to compromise at all. You know, all they're saying is, well, we want a deal where you're going to agree to cut some federal expenditures. And yeah, they'll come up with some kind of deal if they do. Over the next 10 years, we'll gradually cut government expenditures. This is ridiculous. What they, they have a perfect opportunity right now for a balanced budget. By sticking with the debt ceiling. Because if you stick with the debt ceiling, all that's saying is is no new debt, no new borrowing, which means tax revenues have to equal tax expenditures. Well, that means they have to do some major slashing, but they don't have to default on the debt. They can slash welfare state expenditures. There, there's no con- a, a, a debt is a contract. There's no question about that. Welfare entitlement programs are not contracts. 
They're just welfare programs. So they could slash Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, um, all the all the uh, grants that they give out to other to, to groups. They could slash foreign aid, close military bases. I mean, look, we've got like 500 military bases here. Uh, we've got like seven or eight hundred in overseas. Just close those bases. What are they good for? What what are they doing for America? In fact, they're actually very destructive for America. Lay off all those soldiers. Uh, put them in the private sector, in the productive sector. Uh, that's what they could be doing. Um, but they may come up with this these little schemes that you're that you're describing here. Say, well, over the next ten years, we're going to cut government spending. But it's all nonsense because it's clear that they're not serious about it. Well, I hope someone knocks some sense into them. What what is your day to day like with your nonprofit? How do you plan your day or your quarters? What do you what do you, takes up most of your time? Well, we put out a, a daily email uh, newsletter that we we strive to make the best libertarian commentary page on the internet. It's called FFF Daily. So we're up at 6 a.m. every morning scouring the internet for really solid libertarian articles, mostly in the mainstream press. I mean, you know, like the L.A. Times and New York Times are clearly not libertarian publications, but oftentimes they will publish a very libertarian type article or op-ed or commentary. We will link to that in our in our daily FFF Daily. I write an article every day. Uh, we call it a blog post, but it's really an article. Uh, and I have for, gosh, I think 20 years, every day, five days a week, I write a full-fledged article on, on libertarianism in the context of what's going on in the world. Uh, we also have a monthly journal. Uh, so I'm uh, on a daily basis, I'm editing articles that, that are sent into our journal that we end up publishing. I'm proofreading the journal. Um, then we've got, um, of course, email to answer, but we, we receive donations. So there's acknowledgement of donations. We, we call our major donors. I do and thank them for their donation. Um, so that's pretty much, we also have online conferences. We're, we're organizing one now on what's called Austrian economics, which is, uh, a, a label put on free market economics that libertarians endorse. We're, we're doing an online conference there. So I'm, contacting possible speakers. Uh, we did one last fall on monetary policy. We've done one on the Kennedy assassination. So that's the type of thing uh, that I do just on a, on a regular daily basis. I'm writing, I'm editing, I'm proofreading, I'm organizing, uh, that sort of thing. And we, do, we also do a, a weekly uh, internet show called The Libertarian Angle that I do with a, a partner uh, named Richard Ebeling who teaches economics at the Citadel. He's a as hardcore a libertarian as I am, so we, we we analyze current events in the context of libertarian perspectives on our show, the the libertarian angle. That's awesome. I I want to help you guys get more popular. How can people best find you? Uh, best place is fff dot org, our uh, our website, and uh, there we've got thirty three years of principled arguments on libertarianism, and there they can subscribe to our FFF Daily or monthly journal. If they like our work, they can donate to us. Uh, but that that's the best place to check us out. And we've got a whole area of multimedia. Of, all of our conferences have been videotaped, so we've got a repository there of fantastic principled case for, for libertarianism. Really appreciate your time. Hope we could do this again. I think that your thinking and is just beautiful. I mean, there's so many more things I want to unpack, like the Fed's going to just printing the dollars that you said, which ruined the monetary system. Like, I'd love to hear about that. Maybe you could just talk a bit about that in closing. Yeah, we, the, the Constitution clearly called into existence a gold coin, silver coin standard. I mean, there's provisions there that the, the federal government is given the power to coin money, not print money. And this is a government of limited powers. The, the, the idea was that it is not in a government like in Europe where government has inherent powers. Uh, it is a government that is, whose powers are limited to those enumerated. And the only power enumerated was the power to coin money. Now, they had the power to borrow, but everybody understood that the, the, the instruments of indebtedness were promises to pay money. So, and then there was a provision that no state shall make anything but gold coins and silver coins legal tender. So it was clear that that was our monetary system. We often hear that we had a paper money backed by gold. That's absolutely false. We never had any paper money. We had paper instruments of indebtedness that promised to pay money. That, that lasted for a hundred years or more. 
And it, it was one of the keys to our rising standard of living, along with open immigration. We had 100 years of open borders as far as immigrants were concerned. We had no income tax, no welfare state, no Social Security. This resulted in the most prosperous nation in history, also the most charitable nation in history. In the 1930s, President Roosevelt just unilaterally, as one of the most shocking and morally repugnant acts in U.S. history, declares the, the gold coin, silver coin standard over he effectively amended the Constitution, which he cannot do. Uh, the, the amendment process is set forth in the Constitution, but he unilaterally declared an end to the system, made it a felony offense. Get this, Jason. Made it a felony offense to own gold coins, and, gold coins, which had been the official money for more than 100 years, 10 years imprisonment. They actually prosecuted people who were caught owning what had been the official money of the United States. Um, for more than 100 years. And, and that was the beginning of the end. They had already established the central bank, the Federal Reserve, in 1913. 1930s, they, they declare paper money as the new paper, as the new monetary system. The purchasing power of this paper money has been in a down, straight downward trend ever since. I mean, they have looted and plundered the American people through the expansion to, of, of the money supply, which is really the inflation. And the beauty of the system from their standpoint is they can blame it all on people who are raising their prices when really they are the cause of the monetary debauchery. The reason prices rise is to reflect the devaluation of the money that they're printing up. And so that's how they ended up doing this. It's, 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 it's actually one of the most destructive and morally repugnant acts in American history. It's totally wild. This Roosevelt guy, the more I learned about him, he was a gangster. Well, you have a law background why aren't you filing a flurry of lawsuits in conjunction with your press movement to help push your agenda? Why don't you sue the federal government to go back to the gold and silver standard and say that was never okay? Or lawsuits in other respects that would help further your agenda? Because all the federal judges are part of this, this system now. I mean, they've been, they've been educated in law schools that that support this kind of system. When when there was there was four justices on the Supreme Court who were declaring much of what Roosevelt was doing unconstitutional. They were called the Four Horsemen. Uh, it was uh, Justices Vandevanner, Butler, McReynolds, and Sutherland, and they were heroic. And there was one swing justice called Roberts that was was voting with the Four Horsemen. So a lot of the Roosevelt program got declared unconstitutional, and rightly so. It was, it was an alien system to the to what was going on in the United States. But like for example, on the gold clause cases, um, where they were, they Roosevelt just nullified all the instruments of indebtedness, including the private instruments of indebtedness that promised to pay gold. He declared them nullified. Said they're they're over. You don't have to pay in gold if you if you uh, owe these bonds. You can just pay them off in paper dollars, cheap and devalued paper dollars. Well, that went to the Supreme Court, and in a five to four decision, they upheld what Roosevelt did. Roosevelt had his infamous court packing scheme. I mean, your, your term gangster is very good. He wanted to pack the court with his cronies. Uh, he, he had it all set forth where he was going to uh, try to repl uh, add an extra justice for every justice that was over 70 in order to give him a clear majority on the court. And the, the Congress, surprisingly enough, said, well, we're not going to go along with this scheme. But at that point, it was over. Uh, Roberts switched over to the other side. They, they call it the switch in time that saved nine. Uh, there's people that defend Roberts and say, well, he didn't really switch, but it, it, it looks pretty bad. And at that point, once it was five to four on a permanent basis, some of the four horsemen started retiring. Uh, Roosevelt put in his cronies. From 1937, in a case called the West Coast Hotel versus Parish, which upheld, I think it was a minimum wage law. Uh, from that point forward, the Supreme Court effectively made it clear they would never declare unconstitutional any violation of economic liberty. So to answer your question, it, it, it's futile. Uh, now, there's a group called the Institute for Justice that is composed of libertarian and conservative lawyers that were formed many years ago that actually take on much of the abuse in terms of what the government does at a both state level and a federal level. For example, eminent domain abuses uh, or occupational licensure abuses. Uh, they've done very heroic work in the legal field to get, to get a lot of this declared unconstitutional. But it's a tough battle when you're, when you're facing all the precedents 
that have been established since the Roosevelt administration. Tough battle, yes. Saying it's futile, it just I don't I can't subscribe to that because the backbone of this country is the fact that the judiciary is something we can rely on on some level. So I hope yeah, that you, Yeah, but you know the principle of stare decisis. I mean once you once you establish these precedents, then you're effectively asking the court to overrule precedent that's been established for decades. What I prefer to do is to get people to start thinking in terms of economic liberty. And once they want to restore economic liberty, we get things start getting repealed. And then we look for constitutional amendments to restore what had been the original system. Then we, then we do things properly as compared to, I think it's very difficult to go in and, and ask the court under principles of stare decisis to overrule a precedent that's been there for 50 years or so. It, uh, it's problematic. I, I think you're much better off changing public opinion in your favor and then amending the Constitution to fortify these principles and, and put them into place. Probably doing both, especially with the level of urgency, is, is necessary. But I don't mean to be disrespectful because yeah. I've, I've engaged a little bit with your work. And I'm very appreciative for the work that you do in this world, the work that you do for this country. And thank you for giving me your time and insight today. This was really, really fascinating. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure and my honor. Thank you very much, Jason. Appreciate you having me on. Thank you.